All right, rise and grind with us right here on the Sports Grid Network, Sirius XM Channel 159. This is the early line. I'm Donnie Wrights out along with Mark Zinno today, and it feels like a football Friday. Why is that? Because number one, we're going to talk football. Number two, training camps are opening up about two weeks, and I want to welcome in Mark to the morning on a Friday. What's good, my guy? Donnie, great to be with you. Finally getting, uh, finally feel, you know, like I've arrived. You know, this is called to the big leagues here, right here. I mean, the exactly. morning line, this is where it's at. I mean, this, this is what we do in the morning. And also, you are right. You're getting caught up to the big leagues because it would have been a little bit of a downer if you had Kevin along with you, but you got Donnie right side here. So we are <laughs> going to go all the way through this morning and have some fun today, Mark. Seven and seven topics here. Raphael Nadal out of Wimbledon? Say it isn't so. You want to talk about from a perspective, Mark, of looking at, oh, my goodness. Djokovic Nadal in the final. We can't sign up enough for this if you are the headliners here for, let's just say, NBC, CBS, or even ESPN. Not going to happen here. Big news out of Wimbledon, Mark. Yeah, and, and Nadal pulling out with the abdominal, the core injury, whatever he's calling it, certainly puts a damper on the uh, on the men's final a little bit. But still, with the bigger picture, is, you know, Nadal's chasing his 23rd Grand Slam uh, final you know, championship. And now it looks like the surgery that he has to have may keep him out for the U.S. Open as well. So he's going to be out for quite some time. You're looking at a little bit of a huge layoff here for uh, for Nadal. Just disappointing and sad. You know, you really kind of were, were, were hoping for a, a Joker Nadal final. And, uh, you know, it, it got the better of him. He said it was one of those things where if he continued to play with it, it would only get worse. And it's, it, you know it's serious when he's making the decision to pull out after the semifinals. Exactly. I mean, these guys live for winning, you know, major championships, and he certainly was going to get one of those Grand Slam titles, at least another shot at it here. It's a shame it has to go that way, but we'll talk much more Wimbledon a little bit later in the show. But also, let's take a look at an impressive performance last night. You saw, you know, Big Chet getting going crazy there for Oklahoma City, but now you have top pick Van Carroll. Impressive last night, Mark, with a win. Looks like 91-78 to 78 over the Houston Rockets, and Van Carroll dropped 17 points in his debut for the Summer League. I always look at summer league games the same way I look at NFL preseason games. It's like, yeah. I'd rather you perform well than perform poorly, uh, but this really is no indicator of what they would do during anything in the regular season. Uh, they're obviously not playing against full-on NBA talent. They're not playing against full-on NBA defenses, so you have to take that with a grain of salt. But like I said, I'd rather the guy perform well and look good. At least it's a hopefully a harbinger that he can do it. Uh, against full-on NBA talent, but still, I, I, I just have a hard time putting that much stock into what I see in summer league games. It's pretty crazy when you think about it, too, because we're so thirsty for, like, NBA action where people want to jump into the odds market, and you see how well Chet Holmgren plays, like, immediately right off the bat, and if you're Orlando, or at least the fan base, like, oh, my goodness, I hope Ben Carroll's not a boss. Trust me, these guys are going to be good basketball players, but I love the ebbs and the flows of this guy plays one day, this guy plays the next day. Who's the best player as a rookie this year? Certainly. We're going to have 82 games to find out who that is shortly here on this, but how about this? Verlander on the mound, close to 40 years old, picks up his 11th win, has been absolutely sensational coming off Tommy John. Who would have thought it? I don't know. I guess Verlander, Mark. Yeah, I mean, it's another guy turning back farther time, just a little bit longer. And what's crazy here is that, like, the Astros are not the Astros from three or four years ago. Like, they're, nope. they're still a good team. But imagine if Verlander was just an average pitcher this year. They probably don't lead the AL West. They probably don't look as good as they do right now, just simply because he's been able, every fifth day, been able to give them quality starts and beyond and put them in position to win a ball game. I don't think people really understand how important that is. Uh, and I saw it in Atlanta with the Braves. It was like Max Freed every fifth day was able to keep them afloat while they were struggling to get their offense right. And it made such a huge difference. And what do you say about Verlander? I mean, he's still one of the top pitchers in the game, especially, I don't want to say like when he wants to be, but when he's on, man, I mean, it doesn't matter his age or, or what uniform he has on, he's going to get guys out. Yeah, and we certainly will do that. And he has been doing that. Let's so welcome in the radio audience this morning here, listening to the early line radio right on the Sports Grid Network, Series XM Channel 159. It's Donnie Wright's out of Mark Zeno, carrying you through from 7 to 9 a.m., getting you ready for your Sports Grid day. Let's keep moving here in the 7 and 7. T. Walson and Nets trade, or what we thought, Mark, was actually a trade here. What? You're going to give up two of your top players, four draft picks for KD? I know KD's good, Mark, but is he that good that he demands that sort of package? Uh, yeah, I mean, you're talking about one of the 10 best players to ever put on basketball sneakers. Like, he is that good. He is going to require that sort of haul. The problem is, in general, for any KD trade, right, that no one's going to be able to give up all that or want to give up all that. So eventually when the Nets agree to this deal, 
Uh, it's not going to be at market value for what Kevin Durant is worth. Yes, I think Kevin Durant would be worth Carl Anthony Towns and Anthony Edwards in a deal, plus draft picks and everything else. That's the sort of fair compensation he should require. It's just really tough to get anybody to agree to that. Yeah, it is. And it just looks stunning when you see it. But Kevin and I talked about it yesterday, how how good Kevin Durant is. Those are the trade packages that are going to start to come up. Lakers, Nets, and Spurs, reason why I put these three teams in it together. Looks like we may need a facilitator here, Mark, to help Russell Westbrook get out of town. Yeah, and th there's no way this is just a straight-up trade. No one's taking him straight up. Someone's got to take salary and everything else. This is not going to fly uh, in a very simple matter. It'll be complex. Yeah, it seems like it will be complex as well, and also close to $50 million complex here for Russell Westbrook. Two other quick topics that we'll hit here. Low-scoring Major League Thursday. I don't like this, Mark. It's not the way I like to get down. Three overs, 10 unders. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And also, how about this? Late last night qualifying here after a win over Jamaica, the United States women's national team is punching their clip here and ready to go to the World Cup. Boy, we got a lot to go over this morning on the early line. Make sure you stay tuned right here. It's Donnie and Mark in the morning. And also coming up next, we're going to talk some Major League Baseball and what actually went down on the diamond yesterday. Make sure you stay tuned right here on The Grid. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. People are going to the betting window betting and betting them the now rim. before the trade takes place. How Diamond dare they bets. do what's fiscally responsible? See how it plays out. Buffalo's going all in right Football now. Football full football. circle. All their chips in the middle of the table. It's do or die for And Godwin being out. They, they've had a little bit of a shakeup. In-game live all access. You could take the points. You can take the money line. And we had to go to San Jose, too. Maybe a small play on San Jose. I'm going to go both underdogs here. I don't want to hear it anymore. Wow. In game live. Prime time. He plays time. like he did in game five. They are going to be all good in game six at home. Boy, boy you want to give the eight and a half points with a desperate team facing elimination. Get the winning edge. Only on Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. You might be the next Daily Fantasy Millionaire. No matter what you watch or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. The morning after. You see that nine to one ticket on Rory McIlroy. Do you agree that Rory should be such a short favorite for next week's Open? No, I, I don't, Benny. I mean, he hasn't won a major since 2014. He's playing at a really high level, but so too are a lot of other guys. Matty Fitzpatrick, Scotty Scheffler, Will Zalatoris. So I can't agree that Roy McIlroy is at nine to one. Look, he's playing and motivated, but at nine to one, I don't think it's a great number. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. Some more games to bet on out there. And actually a futures market, DRS, would you believe it? For the Vegas Summer League champion, OKC and the Detroit Pistons are co-favorites at plus 750. Portland 12 to 1 alongside the Nets at the same number. With the top five being rounded out, a couple of teams really all in that scenario at a 14 to 1. Orlando, Memphis, Indiana, and the Philadelphia 76ers. Only on Sports Grid. Pharrell, coast to coast. You know, Judge, uh, last night is 30th. And, you know, this guy is just absolutely raking home runs and RBIs. And but Judge has had a great year. He's playing himself into a $300 million, maybe $400 million contract. We're going to have to see. And inevitably, the guy who's going to make the key decision on whether he stays or goes is going to be Aaron Judge. I think we could be headed toward another Freddie Freeman type situation. The Sports Grid Network.
Welcome right on in here to the early line. Getting your day started the right way on Sports Grid on your right side here with Mark Zeno tackling some Major League Baseball. I like overs. I like runs. Mark, I like home runs even more than anything. And yesterday, I put out a slate of about 13 or so guys that I thought would be able to hit home runs yesterday. I got one of them early in Derek Hall for the Philadelphia Phillies. I got none of them late. Thank you, Atlanta Braves. Thank you, Colorado Rockies. Thank you, Arizona Diamondbacks. So we're going to start today with the Astros, who continue to put up Ws. And you brought it up in the first segment here, Mark. This is one of those teams where we looked at in the past that actually was much more talented than the version that we're getting in 2022. But yet, this organization continues to pump out good baseball players, solid young guys coming up. And certainly, even though you're losing guys like Gary Cole, you can replace them with other pitchers. The Astros have been sensational. They're one of the best teams in baseball, Mark, if not the best, and yet easily picking up another win yesterday, 5-2 to two over the Royals, 9-1 and one in their last 10. It seems like it's expected now, Mark, from those Astros. And oh, by the way, it was a little contentious there. For those of us who uh, in that game have been fading Chris Bubik all year long. Uh, hi. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they started out to an early lead, and it was like, man, is this going to go upside down here for Verlander against one of the worst statistical pitchers in all of baseball this year in Bubik? Uh, and it was not to be as the Astros pushed a – you know, it was funny because they had three runs off of four hits in the fifth inning, and somehow they were leading that game three to two. But still, like you said, they just keep piling up wins. And honestly, they're doing it with pitching. I mean, they're have, they have, they're one of the, the teams in the league that gives up the fewest runs. It took me a second to get that out. It's a little early here uh, on the East yeah. Coast. But nonetheless, you know, they're doing it with pitching because their offense is – think of all the guys that they've lost offensively since they won the World Series back in 2017. You know, Correa's gone. I mean, just a, there's a whole bunch of bats out there that aren't there anymore – uh, and this isn't an offense that mashes the way it used to. It's good. Uh, it's not like, you know, substandard, but it's just not a team that 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 hit the heck out of the ball the way they used to. So uh, it's impressive to say the least. But like I said, when you have an anchor like Verlander in the rotation, it makes things so much easier because you know every fifth day you're probably going to be on the right side of winning. Yeah, and also it's a great it's a great tagline there being on the right side of winning, Mark. So kudos to you for bringing that up in the there morning. But if we take a look here <laughs> at the Astros overall with that lineup, you're right. They're one of the better under teams in Major League Baseball. And quite frankly, this team is in a smaller ballpark. So that pitching staff is really holding up well. They just continue to win. It also was pretty big over the past like week or so going up to New York and then also back down in Houston handling their business against the Yankees and the Mets. Another team finally yeah. handling their business, but you're supposed to, Mark, handle your business against the Washington Nationals. You're supposed to beef up your records here. The Phillies, after an explosion of an 11 to nothing win, somehow went dormant at the plate the following night, striking out 16 times. And quite frankly, yesterday it looked like they were headed for another loss against Johanna Doan of the Nationals, but the Phillies pulled out yesterday. And also Kyle Schwarber, absolutely red hot June into July. I don't know what the Philly season is going to hold for us here, but at least taking two or three out of the Nats before you take on the St. Louis Cardinals, good moves there for the Phillies yesterday. And the Phillies are absolutely getting a wounded Cardinals team at this point in time, right? Like yeah. This is an opportune time for them to sort of try and make some sort of run to put themselves in position at the trade deadline to figure out where they want to be. Uh, and and with the Mets and the Braves playing as well as they are right now, uh, and the Phillies sitting eight games back, they've got to do something to sort of close that gap, get in the five range uh, by, the, by the, the trade deadline to really be able to assess – what they are. You're talking about a St. Louis Cardinals team uh, that despite the fact they won last night, uh, they have not been scoring runs. They have been cold. The bats have been silent. Uh, and this is a team that uh, that had a, a lead in the NL Central. Uh, they were they were going neck and neck with Milwaukee. Milwaukee separated a little bit, but the Cardinals are just sort of slumped here uh, in, from the latter part of June into early July. So maybe the Phillies could take advantage and go beat up on a, a Cardinals team that isn't as good maybe as we thought they were going to be. Yeah, a few segments down the line, we're going to talk about some of those prices there in the National League to see how maybe some of these teams can creep up, who's going to fade fast, and who's going to hold for the summer. I'll tell you one team that's looking to hold on for the summer right now, and quite frankly, a little bit earlier they're holding on than probably what they thought was going to be. New York Mets, 10 to nothing over the Miami Marlins yesterday. If you would have asked me and said, look at these two pitchers, Mark, Castano and Williams, we're going to get runs. Well, we did. We got 10 of those. But how about Trevor Williams? Seven innings, no earned runs, and boy, the Mets needed it and said, whoa! We actually gained the game on the Braves last night, Mark. That's pretty good. Yeah, and it's interesting because I've been studying sort of the Braves 
the way they got back into this thing. You know, it was May 31st when the Mets had a 10 and a half game lead yes. over the Braves. And it looked like it was, you know, people in, in New York were screaming, oh, it's over. You know, this, this is the NL East. This is our division. There's no way the Mets are losing. And now all of a sudden it's back to, it was a two and a half game lead, but now it's, you know, uh, back to three and a half. Still, this is a, a Mets team that really in the grand scheme of things hasn't played poorly since May 31st, they've played a little bit better than 500 ball, which is kind of what you have stretches of in baseball, right? You want to get those stretches where you're going to play 600 ball, where you're going to win six out of 10 and go six and four over, over a 10 game stretch. But they've been floating around 500. The problem is that the Braves have played well above that number uh, and had a 21 and four month of June. You know, those are just not common. They don't, they don't come often and they made up the ground that they needed to make to put themselves back in this thing. So, I don't think it's about the Mets and how poorly they have played. I don't we even say the Mets have played poorly. They've just played, you know, right around 500, which you're going to have stretches of during the season and you need to survive them. You know, it's better than being, you know, below 500. Right? It's better than having losing because they might have lost that that grip on first place had they been below 500 the way the Braves played. So timing is a big part of it, but I'm not too concerned about the Mets, especially when they get DeGrom and Scherzer back. It'll be a, a pun intended shot in the arm. Uh, it, it will it will absolutely elevate this team. They've done their part to hover around 500 while their two biggest starters are out of their rotation, right? When those guys come back, you'll see a massive difference. Yeah, I talked about it a few times here. If you would have just said, all right, forget about how the season actually went here, Mark. And you said, all right, we're going to have probably Scherzer down for about a month and a half to Grom, basically missing the first half of the year. And you're still going to have a lead by the time we hit July the 8th. You would have taken it. Now, putting that in proper context, sure. you're right. Heading into the month of June, you had a double-digit lead. But I think they'll still take that at this point. And also, how about this one? We're talking about divisional leads and trying to gain some weight here. The Boston Red Sox lose 6-5 to five to the New York Yankees. Now, this actually could have read, Mark, Yankees 6, Raphael Devers five but the Yankees hold off and for some reason Garrett Cole one of the best pitchers in Major League Baseball Raphael Devers has his number but just not hey you needed six runs out of Devers come on buddy help out the Sox right Mark yeah and it's interesting because you know for Garrett Cole like if you would have told me that Garrett Cole was going to have nine wins um you know as we'd be sitting at the beginning of July he's going to have nine wins he'll be tied for the 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 league you know the staff wins uh, on the Yankees, and you told me that he the Yankees would be in first place, I wouldn't have been surprised if you would have told me that Garrett Cole like has the second highest ERA of any Yankee starter. I would have been like, what has gone terribly wrong with the Yankees? I mean, he really, for all of Garrett Cole's exploits and how good he is, he hasn't really been the, quote, ace of that staff. He's the ace in name, but from a performance standpoint, he just doesn't uh, have the numbers comparatively speaking to the rest of the Yankee staff that we've seen. So, um, and I don't say that as a pejorative, it's just a, an odd circumstance that very average Garrett Cole uh, isn't the best version of average on any given staff, right? Because if, if any, every staff yeah. had an average Garrett Cole, they'd be very happy. Well, the Yankees should be happy, but again, they're also scoring a ton of runs uh, and, and, and each one of these pitchers is getting a lot of run support, so it makes it very easy. But, yeah, um, as long as Garrett Cole keeps taking the ball every fifth day and keeping his team in games, it's, it's good enough at this point. 60 wins now for those New York Yankees. We'll see what their number. They can run that up this summer, maybe even challenging the Seattle Mariners. Quickly want to hit this topic of the Blue Jays. Drop six of seven. Like We just talked about the Yankees and the Red Sox going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. What is going on with the Toronto Blue Jays? Quickly, Mark, what's going on? I don't know. I, um, this team was supposed to be better, and it's really not fair to judge them in the prism of the NLE, uh, ALE standings because nobody's catching the Yankees at this point. But I, would, I thought the pitching was going to be better for Toronto, and it just hasn't been. No, it certainly hasn't. They're playing teams that they should be mopping up, and they're certainly struggling, which is definitely a surprise. But you know we're going to check in on? Yeah, we're in the month of July, about halfway through Major League Baseball season with the All-Star break coming up. Let's take a look at some of these seasonal leaders and where they stack up. Home run, Cy Young, Rookie of the Year. Come on back with us. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. They play 
less games. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less. Rogers and the morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. sports the today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell coast to coast. That's where they win cups. They win Stanley Cups over there. Give me the Game pass. time decisions. Kind of bizarre when you consider it. Like the, everybody is out for the Warriors. In game, live, I all like access. Vandy. I like Vandy against Bam. I think Vandy can win the game, take a four and a In half. game, oh, live, man. prime oh, yeah, time. Major, the PGA champion. In yes. game, live, overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. The Pat McAfee Show. Pat, anyway. have you ever devoured hot dogs like that ever? No. Like, have, you, have you thought about it? Could you could you enter that challenge? No, so I'm a good chugger. Like a liquid chugger, I can make things disappear like uh, Badlands. I think I could get Badlands uh, a gallon of lemonade at some point. The eating thing, I can't though, Shams. You love lunch. We all know that. Yeah, have you I'm, ever attempted the... I'm not. The, uh... I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> I, got, I got one or two hot dogs in me. I don't think I can devour them like, like, like Joey Chestnut. I'm sorry. The Sports Grid Network. The morning after. The Panthers host week number one in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Yes, that familiar yep. foe, the Cleveland Browns. And the Browns only a slight one point favorite as of right now. That total relatively low, 42 and a half. It's funny how things work out, huh? Baker Mayfield is new home in Carolina, and then he gets to play Cleveland that opening week of the NFL. The biggest question with me with Baker Mayfield is going to be that right. locker room. The Sports Grid Network. Fantasy Sports Today. Oh my gosh, like if this is their end game for 14 games next season, there's no winning, is there? There's no winning for the Cleveland Browns this season. I just, there, there's no way that they make the playoffs. There's no way that they win 10 games. I, I think there is a chance that they are the worst team in this division, depending on the quarterback play that the Pittsburgh Steelers get. You know, if... if... The Sports Grid Network. The early line. Finally, we've seen the resolution come in after months of wondering as Baker goes to Carolina in exchange for just a conditional 2024 fifth round pick. It's the move that was supposed to happen, right, Kevin? This is what we were anticipating for months and the urgency that we read about just a few weeks ago finally came to fruition here early in July. You get him in ahead of camp. Only on Sports Grid. Right back at it here on the early line, Series XM Channel 159 on the Sports Grid Network. It's a Friday, and it might certainly feel like a football Friday, but we're going to talk a lot of Major League Baseball here in the next coming segment. Donnie and Mark here in the morning, MVP odds. Now, before we get to the NL, yesterday, Kevin and I, Mark, broke down Shohei Otani versus Aaron Judge. We take a look at the FanDuel Sportsbook this morning, plus 100 MVP odds for Aaron Judge plus 200 MVP odds for Shohei Otani. This is a clash of the Titans that we hope will have both of these players healthy and playing well down the stretch. I need to ask your opinion, Mark. As it settles yeah. right now or even into the future, how are you looking at this Judge versus Otani deal here? I mean, it, it, look, as a Yankee fan, full disclosure, I hope Judge wins the thing. Uh, but there <laughs> is a certain amount of... Um, you know, the where where the odds are now, they're not going to shift all that much. The only thing you can hope, honestly, if you want some value, is that somebody else gets into this thing, whether it's Trout or Alvarez or wherever it may be, because it's not worth it. To, if you didn't get Otani, who, oh, by the way, was one of the favorites to win the MVP at the beginning of the year anyway, but if you didn't get Judge you know, at some time in April, you're you're already behind the curve. There, there's no reason to bet him now, basically, at even money uh, to, to win the thing. And and I'm with you. I hope we see a back and forth. Uh, but remember that we've got to this weird space with MVP voters. They've become sort of very like, um, I want to make sure everybody can get one kind of deal. And it happens in the NBA more so. It doesn't really happen in the NFL that much, but it's one of those things where well, he's already got one, so I'm going to vote for the other guy if it's close because I voted for Otani last year. And that may favor Judge a little bit more outside of the numbers favoring him a little bit more when it's all said and done. And if Judge 
flirts with 60, uh, and he's halfway there already. Uh, he, if he flirts with 60 um, and, and that number beyond, I don't know that there's anything Otani can do. As much as we know what the steroid era has done, we are still suckers for the home run ball, and baseball fans and baseball writers in particular are sucker for baseball records. And when you start to approach one, that is where they're going to gravitate towards without fail. So that's really the big thing for Judge. If he can flirt with 60, 61, and sort of make all of this feel semi-legitimate in the non-steroid era, because we know what McGuire did, we know what Bonds did, we know what Sosa did, you might have the first guy who legitimately, in 162 games since Maris, was able to eclipse 61 home runs. And, and, and there's a certain nostalgia that everybody would love about all that. Breaking records, Mark, as I like to say, is the ultimate equalizer. Because you're right. When you do something historic, you're going to get more attention. But it's also, you're right, some fatigue. If you take a look at Shohei Otani, which might even win, who knows, get into the race for the AL Cy Young Award, which we're going to talk about in just a few moments here. But we'll say, ah, he hit 270, 35 home runs, dominated. Pit. Yeah, but he did it last year. It's like Giannis in the NBA. Giannis could go 28, 15, and 5, win the MVP, carbon copy that same statistical line the next year, and we go, yeah, I needed a little bit more out of Giannis this year. Come on now. I mean, we all always do that here and rightfully so right. it's just you know human votings that go into it there so i do see that let's get to the nl mvp because as we talked about in the al seems like a two-man race judge otani we'll see if alvarez trout or devers get into it but this is fascinating paul goldschmidt sits at a plus 100 identical odds here in the american league to aaron judge manny machado six to one alonzo plus 650 mookie betts 11 to one trey turner 18 to one and another dodger freddie freeman 25 to one now bryce harper was in the mix here but damages his thumb gets that you know snell takes a fastball right off of his thumb. He'll be out probably six to eight weeks. He's out of the race. But this one seems a little bit more wide open with better pricing here. I just don't know where to look because you're right. Paul Goldschmidt, if the St. Louis Cardinals win their division, sure, he's going to get a bump. Manny Machado hanging around the NLS waiting for Tatis to come back before that team is complete and maybe they can make a run. Pete Alonzo was that one at plus 650 where it looked like the start he had to the season, Mark. He might have been a shoe in the win NL MVP with the way the actual Mets have been playing, getting their bump. What are your thoughts here on the NL MVP as it sits today at the FanDuel Sportsbook? Well, Alonzo's got to start hitting more home runs again. Um, and, and he doesn't have to be at the rate that Judge does. But if he wins the NL home run crown, as you said, those sort of things – Stick with the mind of voters. He was the best home run hitter in all of the National League. That's going to matter. What's going to matter for Machado is if the Padres can catch the Dodgers. Six games back right now, as you mentioned, Tatis hopefully coming back. You know, fingers crossed if you're a, a Padres fan. But that will matter. Um, that absolutely will matter. If they can supplant the Dodgers, who have won, what is it, eight consecutive now uh, in our West titles, right? Is, am, I, am I getting that wrong? Somewhere in that range? But anyway... Or seven of eight, I can't remember, to be 100% honest. But you know, if they can finally get over the hump and win an NL West title, that's going to be the feather in the cap for Machado to be able to take this thing home. I don't know that Goldschmidt, for as much as he's the odds-on favorite, it's, it's almost one of those things where we're sitting here looking at him right now as the favorite, but the Cardinals are going to start to fade, and if they or, or starting to fade, if they continue to fade, and Milwaukee runs away with that thing, the framing of Goldschmidt winning the MVP – seems a little bit sort of um, soured. And and there's a tendency, and, and it's a human nature tendency, just like Ozmakers, you can become prisoner of the moment a little bit, um, that, that you're sort of going with the flow and where things are. But I, I could see a paradigm shift in the NL. Not so much in the ALs. We just talked about with Otani and Judge, but I, I think you could see some of these other guys at better than 6-1 to one really make a push for valid reasons to go on and, and, and be legitimate contenders for the NL MVP. Yeah, if the Dodgers go on that summer run, like they're so talented now getting healthy. You saw Mookie Betts inserted right back into that lineup yeah. and absolutely launching balls into the seats. He sits there at 11 to 1 because you're right. If you have the St. Louis Cardinals and they go on a run for the rest of the summer, Goldschmidt does get that bump. But you're looking at so many talented players behind that. You're looking at more of that star explosiveness, like Manny Machado, if he turns the Padres season around. Pete Alonso can hit 15 home runs in the month of August and really propel himself along with the Mets, staying in first place here in the NL. So it's a wild market to look at. Let's take look at some pictures here, Mark, on a Friday. Cy Young Award winners. Now, look, we're talking about a pitcher's ballpark and a guy having a sensational season. That's Sandy Alcantara down for the Miami Marlins at a plus 110 price. Old friend Corbin Burns there sitting at a plus 550. Musgrove, who had a very good performance last night for the Padres at 9-1. to Gonsolin, 12-1. to Freed, 13-1. to And Zach Wheeler of the Philadelphia Phillies at 18-1. to Big favorite here for Alcantara. 
Look, he's plays in the NL East, but he does play in a true pitcher's ballpark, and he's been wonderful. Do you think he can hold that lead sitting here as the FanDuel favorite at plus 110 through the rest of the summer, Mark? I mean, part of me genuinely hopes so. Um, and the Cy Young is the one award that we've learned over the years where the periphery doesn't matter, right? I mean, it's one of those things. Remember, King Felix won it with like a 13 and uh, yep. eight record. Absolutely. You know, like, it's not the typical 20-win guy that has to do anymore. We've gotten into the analytics world for some reason when it comes to pitchers and looking at their award, but we don't do that. No one's measuring exit velocity as an MVP, you know, uh, statistic, right? Like, that's not what anybody puts in the equation. On OBP, slash line, home runs, whatever it is, and that's it's, it's that simple. With pitchers, it becomes a little bit different. Uh, you know, you get into the whip and the walk rate and the K rate and all these other things that typically 10, 15 years ago, no one cared about when it came to becoming the Cy Young. You had to win 18 to 20 games. You had to have a low ERA, and that's it. And so things have changed a little bit. And so I kind of hope for Alcantara that – that or Alcantara, rather, that that it, it works out in his favor um, that he's able to do this. But Joe Musgrove, to me, it's, it's another thing with the Padres. If they get over the hump and win the NL West – Musgrove is going to be a big reason why. Now, shocker, he's lost two in a row after eight, eight no starts, so pump the brakes here a little bit. But that said, he still went out in his last start in a no decision, seven innings, one hit, no runs, and strikes out six. I mean, he has been utterly dominating all year long and consistent in every start. Uh, and even Gonsolin, to a certain expect, respect, has had that same sort of domination through uh, this part of the season. So there are a lot of names out there. It's a very, very muddled race when it comes to the NL Cy Young, it's just a question of, you know, uh, who is going to have the best stretch run. I think we may end up with, as I mentioned earlier, whichever guy finishes the strongest may be the one that gets it. And certainly, I don't know what's in the water down in Florida, but if we take a look at the AL Cy Young Awards here, Shane McClanahan of the Tampa Bay Rays, a plus 250 price leading the way here. So two teams that are in pitchers' ballparks don't get much fanfare, but have dominant pitching staffs, or at least that front end of the rotation. Justin Verlander, who was great yesterday, a plus 270 price closing in. Garrett Cole, we talked about the Yankees, gave up five earned runs yesterday to Raphael Devers alone. He's plus 850. And Shohei Otani now under 10 to 1 mark at a plus 950 price. What are we looking at here in the AL Cy Young Awards for you? Two horse race. It's either McClanahan or Verlander. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of laughable. Like Garrett Cole is there because of name recognition. He just doesn't have anywhere near dominant. No, I can't remember a Cy Young Award winner with a 3-5 ERA. <laughs> right? Like, I mean, people would lose their mind if Garrett Cole, even if he won 20 with a 3-5 ERA, mm -hmm. you're sitting here going, come on, man. Like, really? You're giving it to a guy who gives up that many runs. There's 20 pitchers who you'd never consider for the Cy Young that have similar or better stats than Garrett Cole across the board. So he's not even a non – he's a non-factor in this thing uh, at all. So I think it's a two-horse race between Verlander and McClanahan. And, again, it's one of those deals where with pitchers it's like, well, the Astros may run away with the, with the AO West, and it, that may be a big part of it. With the Rays, they don't have to be very good, but every fifth day if McClanahan goes out there and is as yeah. dominant as he is, it's like that's the guy you want to be the Cy Young because he's doing it all on his own every single start. I'll tell you an interesting angle, too. When we talk about that human element, Mark, of voting on MVPs or AL Cy Young or NL Cy Young. You take a look at Shohan, Shohei Otani there at that plus 950 price. Is this one of those things to say, well, Aaron Judge was the MVP? All right, let's go ahead and settle and give the Cy Young award here, yeah. bump here to Shohei Otani, or even vice versa. Shohei Otani ends up being dominant on the mound throughout the rest of the season and doesn't hold up against Aaron Judge. He wins the MVP. It should be fun to watch this market play out. But I do want to hit one of these topics coming up after the break. You're talking about rookie of the years and also who is going to be the home run king in major league baseball in 2022 a lot of baseball talk here on a friday on the early line we'll also transition to some nfl a little bit later in the show you don't want to miss out stick right here it's mark and donnie in the morning rise and shine Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 
pregame, pregame. Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Cam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions only on Sports Grid. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio. Listen free on the Sports Grid Radio app, iHeart, or tune in, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. The Pat McAfee Show. Kevin Durant made a decision that only, you know, he can make in terms of going to the Nets and requesting a trade out of Brooklyn. And uh, from everything I'm told, uh, that stance has not changed. He, there's been no signal that he's going to back off of that. If anything, that stance is expected to continue. And the Phoenix Suns, uh, from everything I've been told, are his number one preferred destination. That's a great I think scene. there's, a, there's a desire to go play with Devin Booker, to go play with Chris Paul. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. It's one team that's very good with the New York Yankees. One team that is so very bad for the Los Angeles Angels, but two star caliber players here that are equally deserving to be MVPs here. One, that is Aaron Judge, who sits now at the FanDuel Sportsbook at a plus 100 to win the AL MVP. And right behind him, Shohei Otani closing the gap at a two to one price. Only on Sports Grid. Pharrell, coast to coast. So the Panthers get Mayfield, and now it's on because I know at some level you're saying that they're not just handing him the starting job. The way it was explained to me privately was this. Matt Rule, the head coach, is personnel control. He was not going to training camp, Pharrell, which starts later this month, without competition for Sam Darnold. And he got that competition in Baker Mayfield. That's what they're going to do. This is what they felt like was the situation all offseason. The Sports Grid Network. Welcome back into the early line. Mark Zeno, Donnie right side here on a Friday on the grid, setting you up for your day on the grid into the weekend you go. But before we do that, we got to tie up some loose ends here in Major League Baseball in the awards market. And I want to talk a little American League Rookie of the Year. Julio Rodriguez, a minus 280 price here. Jeremy Pena, plus 600. Bobby Witt Jr., 13 to 1 of the Royals. Adley Rutschman, who finally got brought up for the Baltimore Orioles, sitting there at a 30 to 1. He did homer last night as well. Are we looking at this Julio Rodriguez? He's hitting missile after missile as the leader in the clubhouse where he's not going to be caught in this market, Mark? It's so hard when you get to Rookie of the Year when it comes to that, to change people's opinions on guys who get out to an early lead. You need, like, it would have to be a case of an injury where he misses time and somebody can catch him and then overwhelm them statistically. But if he plays the rest of the year, it's nearly impossible to change people's minds on who's going to be the rookie of the year. Um, It's a weird thing we do when it comes to young players. We get very static on where they are. Uh, if they start out hot, we unless, again, you, you see a massive fade and a precipitative drop-off in their numbers, it's this is his award to lose. There, there's not really any reason to bet anybody else. Now, I, I'm a sucker for Adley Rushman uh, from the Baltimore Orioles because I think the kid's going to be fantastic, and I'd love to see him really make a push at this thing. Uh, so maybe there's some some value there that you could talk me into, but it's just really, really hard to catch these guys when they get out to this big of a lead. 
Yeah, the way the Baltimore Orioles operate, Adley Rutschman, catcher for the New York Yankees in a couple years, could be, Mark, could be. But let's take a look at the NL Rookie of the Year market, which I think is absolutely fascinating. I know you wanted to touch on this. Spencer Strider, who's that? Well, if you're not watching Major League Baseball and you want to take a bat and try to hit this guy, good luck. Now, I do wear this with a badge of honor here, Mark. If we're taking a look just from a pitcher's perspective, I backed Spencer Strider one time, hyped him up so much on the show in a first five innings wager, and he got rocked. And I said, ah, maybe Strider just really isn't that good. But my goodness, he is. He's now a plus 350 to win rookie of the year as a pitcher. Michael Harris, a plus 350 price. O'Neal Cruz, the sixth. Foot seven shortstop for the Pittsburgh Pirates at plus 430. Mackenzie Gore, seven to one. But as I take a look right now, you're talking about Strider, who went, no pun intended, making strides in Major League Baseball. This guy's got a power arm. He's fun to watch. And it just seems, Mark, the Braves continue to find good, young pitching prospects here. Yeah, what's interesting is he's plus 350 right now. Prior to last night's start, before he threw uh-huh. a pitch, and when game which he struck out 12 batters in six innings, folks, that's 18 outs. He struck out 66% of those batters uh, to get those 18 outs. Uh, he was plus 500. So you've already lost $1.50 in value uh, in one start on this kid. And, oh, by the way, this is the same guy, and you talked about that start because I had backed him early on his K props because I saw what he did out of the bullpen before he was a converted starter. And as soon as his K props popped up, they were at four and a half for the first start, over hit. Five and a half for the second start, over hit. And then what he did is he had an 11 strikeout performance and odds makers and everybody took over. Whoa, whoa. You're not getting a Spencer Strider strikeout prop below six and a half for the rest of the year. So kiss those goodbye. They're not coming back. It was six and a half last night. He obviously cashed in the third inning, which is insane. Um, but this really may be his award to lose at this point in time. And his teammate, oh, by the way, Michael Harris of the Atlanta Braves, the center fielder there, has been phenomenal, uh, is also at plus 350. I think it's a two-horse race there. I mean, O'Neill Cruz obviously could make some noise. But when you have this kind of stuff that Spencer Strider has that's electric that everybody takes notice of, it is, uh, it's hard to forget, and he's got a creepy mustache on top of it all, which is also hard to forget. So uh, I-, I love Strider. Even at 350, I jump on him now. I don't know that these odds are going to go in the other direction again. Um, it would take a, a really phenomenal performance by somebody else, whether it's Harris or Cruz or even Mackenzie Gore or somebody like that, to really overtake Strider. He's going to continue to go out there and mow guys down. What are we suckers for? Home runs and strikeouts still. And he does one of those things really, really well. Yeah, he plays the part, too. You're right, with the mustache. Hey, who's that Strider guy? Oh, he's the guy out there with the mustache. Oh, that's who that is. Yep, heard about him before. And also, when we try to take a look, Mark, around the league, right? You usually get a book on, like, a young rookie hitter that's hot. He can't hit the breaking pitch outside. He struggles with fastballs up and in. You take a look at a guy like Strider. This isn't a guy that's just, like, I throw an 83-mile-an-hour curveball. Come try to figure me out. He's coming at you with power. 96, 97, 98, 99 miles an hour of heat. It's really hard to say, hey, I know it's coming. I can still hit it. But when you get that heat up around a hundred miles an hour it's still hard to make a move we'll see how he does for the rest of the summer but my goodness he's gonna have a an advantage against everybody the rest of this year simply because everybody's gonna be seeing him for the first time like the cardinals did last night it was the first time they saw him the cardinals are one of the lowest strikeout teams in major league baseball they struck out 12 times against strider and 18 times last night overall uh but that tells you that he has that advantage because you can watch all the tape you want donnie but really there's a big difference between, you know, a 95 mile an hour fastball and a 99 mile an hour fastball. I've always said that for years. Like the difference between 99 and 97 or 97, 95 is huge. Not so much the difference between like 92 and 90, right? Like there's no difference there um, between when it, but once you get 95 plus, every mile an hour makes a huge, huge difference. And he's got a major advantage against all these guys because they're seeing him for the first time. Just to let you guys know how fun betting baseball is, you start that game yesterday, Strider versus Libertor. You see the final stat line on what Strider did yesterday, and you say, boy, I'm glad I won all my money on the Bra- – no, you didn't. The Braves actually lost in extra innings. That is why baseball is so maddening at this point. Now, you talked about we love strikeouts, and we do. We love big-time pitching performance. Yes, we do as well, but also – The ball leaving the yard is so much fun to cap, handicap, watch, cheer on, 
and apparently vote for here now on the FanDuel Sportsbook. Why? The regular season home run leader for 2022 in the FanDuel Sportsbook does have a market here, Mark. If we take a look, it's no surprise. Leader in the clubhouse, Aaron Judge. A little bit creaky now, showing some wear and tear as we're in the month of July with 30 home runs. Kyle Schwarber coming on like crazy over the past six weeks here, a plus 360 price. Jordan Alvarez here of the Houston Astros, a plus 550 number. Mike Trout, 12 to 1. Pete Alonzo, the polar bear, at 14 to 1. Now, if we take a look at the overall standings here, they were the odds. Judge got 30 home runs, Kyle Schwarber, 27, Alvarez, 26, Trout, 23. Obviously, the leader in the clubhouse is Aaron Judge, and he should be here. He's having a wonderful summer. But my question to you, Mark, seeing those odds and seeing where they line up, is there somebody with the ability to track down Aaron Judge this summer and say, no, 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 Judge, you're not the king. I'm the king. It's Trout. I mean, he's got the track record to prove it. And what you're hoping for, and God, I didn't even want to speak it into the ethos of the universe as a Yankee fan, but if Judge has to sit for a protracted period of time due to uh, the, you know, that I word, again, I don't even want to say it, um, mm -hmm. because he's got a history of not staying healthy. Uh, so if that happens to him, that's when someone's really going to catch him. And home runs come in bunches for all these big home run hitters, right? I mean, you're, you're going to get to a stretch where – uh, you're going to see a guy like Trout have 12 home runs in a month, right? Whether it's this month or next month, and he's really going to be able to put some dent in some of these things uh, or put a dent in the lead that that Judge has or anybody else has for that matter. That's the guy I would just pick based off of his track record. Uh, Schwarber is too much of a home run or strikeout kind of batter, in my opinion, where um, one is going to take over supremely, and if it is, I think it's probably going to be the strikeouts more than the long ball. So I, I'm weary of him and him being able to keep up this pace. But you're also kind of – let's just say for argument's sake, Aaron Judge does play the rest of the year and stays healthy. It's, there's a reason why only two guys naturally hit 60 home runs in a year. It's really, really, really hard to maintain that pace, right? Uh, and the idea of anybody hitting 55 even anymore seems almost foreign – um, with how much the, the ball has been deadened and, and what we're looking at now, as much as there are gross amounts of home runs being hit, it's not by one or two guys anymore the way it used to be in Major League Baseball. So I would expect some judge regression, and you have to believe it's the case. As much as I don't want it to be, it's just really hard to be able to hit 60 in a regular season, staying healthy enough and keeping up that pace. Um, the one fortunate pleasure that Aaron Judge may have is that – he doesn't need to hit home runs to win games, right? The, the Yankees are going to, as it stands right now, they're not going to be playing in a number of high-level, high-pressure games down the stretch because they're going to walk away with the with the American League East. So that allows him to stay a little bit relaxed and allows him to just sit back and, and kind of take each at-bat as it comes to him. I, I think that actually aids him in hitting more home runs. If they were in a pennant race and fighting to win every game, forget the home run, man. Just play station-to-station -station baseball and help us win baseball games. I think that's probably a different approach for each hitter. Yeah, and also we try to take those seasonal expectations before the season and take the temperature mid-season. Aaron Judge sitting at 30 home runs. So obviously we're saying, like, hey, there's a legitimate chance he can get the 60 home runs, which is historic. But also imagine if before the season said, hey, you know what? In a contract year, Aaron Judge is going to knock out 47 home runs. Whoa, what a season. It would almost be a disappointment how crazy that sounds at this point. But also keeping in mind the top three guys in order here of home runs hit 30 for Judge, Schwarber 27, and Jordan Alvarez 26, all play in hitters ballpark so that certainly helps nice. you out Mike Trout a little bit more of a pitcher's ballpark out there in LA and then we see you know you can't really leave out Pete Alonzo because he's so big and strong it doesn't matter but not nearly the same hitters ballpark that those top guys have let's transition a little bit here Mark to some of the divisional races now it's easy to say hey Mark who do you think is going to win the AL East well it's probably going to be the Yankees who do you think is going to win the AL West probably going to be the Houston Astros but one of those teams or excuse me one of those divisions sandwiched in there that is the AL Central here with the Minnesota the Twins at a minus 120 price. Now, before the season started, if you would have asked me out of all the divisions, Mark, NL and AL respectively, I looked at the Chicago White Sox as almost a shoe-in to win this division. Frontline talent, bullpen talent, one through nine talent in the lineup here. And here we are sitting with the Minnesota Twins as now the favorite to win this division where the Twins may have been sellers at the break, now looking to add on. What are your thoughts here on the AL Central and how that might shape up here? I've said this repeatedly for the last month. 
when it comes to the AL Central. I said it on on, on the morning after. I've said it on In Game Live, all across Sports Grid. There is no other bet to make other than the Chicago White Sox at plus money purely from a value standpoint. Look, if you wanted to take the Guardians or you wanted to take the Twins and you didn't do it in April or May when the White Sox were still at minus money to win this division, um, you've lost all the value on both those teams. What am I going to bet on the Minnesota Twins now at minus 120 when they were plus 700, plus 800 back in April and May? Like, it just makes no sense to bet on them. Conversely, you're looking at the White Sox, as you said, with such heavy favorites. What are they, minus 275 um, to win yeah. this division? Is somewhere in that range at the beginning of the year? I'm getting plus money on the best roster in that division right now. There's no other bet to make other than the White Sox. Keep your fingers crossed. Hope they turn this thing around. And remember, they don't have to win 95 games to win a division. They just have to win one more than the next team. Whether that's 85 games, 86 games, or 90 games, it doesn't matter when this particular bet doesn't matter how many games they win, as long as it's one more than the Minnesota Twins or the Cleveland Guardians, you're going to cash your ticket. So all the value is with the White Sox. There's no value anywhere else at this point in time. Maybe the Guardians, but they look like they're fading. You know, now back at plus 480 when they were they, they, there was a time where they were both the White Sox and the Twins. I'm sorry, the Twins and the Guardians, rather, were both ahead of the White Sox. But still, I can't convince anybody of any other value other than the White Sox at this point. Yeah, the White Sox sitting six games back as we look at the standings right now. It's not as if, Mark, as you said, you got to chase the Yankees down. You got to chase the Astros, maybe the Dodgers or the Mets down. You got to chase the Minnesota Twins down. You're the pedigree team in that division. We'll see if they can step up. And also, how about this? A run differential for the Chicago White Sox as we sit here on July 8th at a minus 45. Get it together, Tony La Russa. But you do have... Some big bats and big boppers back on the way. Maybe some of that pitching staff can get it to act together and certainly not get injured down the stretch, which they have been over the first few weeks of the season. Excuse me, first few months. It is what it is here. Short segment coming up before we hit the top of the hour. Come on back with us right here on The Grid. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. They played last game. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less. Aaron Rodgers and the, the morning after. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell and coast to ABG, coast. That's where they win cups. Stanley Cups over there. Give me the game penguins. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider it. like the, everybody is out for the Warriors. In game Everyone. live all like access. Mandy. I like Vandy against Bam. I think Vandy can win the game, take a corner. In half. game oh, live man. prime oh, time. The major, the PGA champion. In yes. game live overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. The morning after. Do you believe it is a just a two-team race between New York and Houston for the American League pennant? I think somebody could beat the Yankees in the postseason. I, I think that some team could come in and pitch very well against them and win. We've seen that happen in the past, and I think it could happen in the future. But look, I've been you know, steadfast and bullish since the very beginning of the season on Houston. I'm not changing that uh, by any means. Mm. I, I still think they're the best team in the American League. I think they have a great shot to win the World Series. The Sports Grid Network. The Pat McAfee Show. I was joking with uh, with a couple of my buddies um, on the squad, and I said, could be a long training camp for the offense. I like the way our defense is, is looking and playing, and, and just on paper, it, it looks like they're going to be pretty formidable. So it could be could be some growing pains for the offense, which would be great for us. It would be nice to, uh, to take our lumps uh, from time to time. The Sports Grid Network. Sports professor Rick Haro inside the $1.3 trillion business of sports with your daily numbers game. Women entering sports books more than ever before. 4.5 million increased overall year over year and about 115% increase in women entering the sports book. Men still outnumber women 250%, but women are making up ground. Some say they're placing their husbands or their boyfriends' bets 
That's not really true when you look at it empirically. More and more women sports fans are getting into the game and putting their money up uh, to be able to generate some significant income. And FanDuel has generated more uh, women uh, entries than ever before, 1.7 million, and the number continues to rise. So look for betting on all sports across the board. Ironically, you'll see the women in the same number as female sponsorship products, football first, basketball second. It follows a familiar trend. Sports professor Rick Haro, Daily Numbers Game. Back at it on the early line, Series 6 of Channel 159, right here on the grid. It's Mark and Donnie on a Friday morning, wrapping up a little baseball talk before we hit the top of the hour and get into some NBA Summer League action and also some Wimbledon. I want to ask you this question here. In the NL, there's two divisions that are really going to be neck and neck, or we think are going to be neck and neck down the stretch. And that's the NL East, Mark. The New York Mets at a minus 145 price. The Atlanta Braves at a plus 140 price. The Braves back about 10 games a month ago, now seemingly right in the rear view mirror for the Mets. And then the NL Central, who the favorite all along, we always thought was going to be the Milwaukee Brewers, and for a while, trying to find their way. But they now sit at a minus 240 price over the St. Louis Cardinals at a plus 185. Your thoughts on these two divisions. Who's more likely to overtake the lead? The Atlanta Braves over the Mets, or is it going to be the Cardinals over the Milwaukee Brewers here? I would lean on the Braves. Uh, look, Milwaukee has better pitching than St. Louis does. If St. Louis's offense can't get right and get back to scoring runs at the rate that they were earlier on in the year, uh, they're going to continue to, to slip uh, and have their lead slip away. But I trust Milwaukee's pitching enough, in particular their starting pitching uh, and, and one of the best bullpens in baseball, for them to hold on to this lead. They're going to be tougher to catch. The Braves' real challenge in catching the Mets is what are you going to get from DeGrom and Scherzer when they get back? Um, name alone, name recognition alone, the Mets have the better starting staff, uh, and and if the numbers back that up, then those guys should absolutely make it tough for the Braves. But it's we always felt like it was the Braves' division to lose, and so them being right where they are right now after a slow start shouldn't surprise anybody. No, it shouldn't there. And also, you know, that Freddie Freeman World Series hangover seems like they've gotten right here. And they have the young arms to do it. And yeah. also, Mark, I always like to bring up about the Braves last year. Like, they weren't a team that was a runaway winner here in the NL. This team made shrewd moves at the trade deadline, added real pieces that helped them win and get into the World Series and win it. I look for a lot of the same here to happen out of that front office for the Atlanta Braves. So some good talk here in Major League Baseball. Coming up here at the top of the hour, Wimbledon talk. Some interesting thoughts on what the final is going to be. And also... Paolo Boncaro stepping up to the plate in his rookie debut in Summer League action. It's Friday on the grid. No better place to be than right here.